Good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to the Now Women Summit. This segment is called The Conversations on the Girl Child. My name is Hannah George and I am from the WTC team. And I'm Daniela and I am a finance consultant. Now, I'm sure you've all been listening to all the inspiring stories throughout the week. We've had leading ladies from various different industries, from the finance industry, marketing, PR, fashion industries, and many, many more. Yeah. So um, just uh, FYI to our audience, um, throughout the session, you are free to ask questions. And Hannah and I will do our best to um, answer them at the end, if there is time, because we have such a big, amazing panel today. Um, but we will do our utmost best to answer all your questions at the end. So again, um, the audience can um, just ask questions in the comment section and we will do our best to answer in the end. Yes. Now, we're going to go straight into introducing all these amazing women today. So, Daniela. Yeah, congrats. it's such an absolute honor um, for Hannah and I to be um, speaking to these amazing ladies today on the panel. I'm so excited. We have Irene Kiwia, who is currently in Tanzania, and she is the founder of Frontline Africa, Ecoba, Tua, and many more um, um, you know, platforms. She is also the president of the Women of Achievement. We also have Tessie Ojo, who is our very own commander of the British Empire and chief executive at the Diana Award. Um, thirdly, we have Enine Odukpuro, and she is the CEO and founder of Enrich Learning. Um, and finally, on my side, we have Dr. May Ikiora, who is currently in Nigeria, and she's the CEO of uh, Lavinia Limited and former anti-human trafficking advisor. And from my side, we have Yasmin Sidwa, who's the artistic director of the Mandala Theatre. We have Elezi Lombonda, education activist, youth and women advocate, and she's the advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defence of the Kingdom of Belgium. Lastly, we have Bisia Bukoko, founder and CEO of BBES and former executive director of the Spain to US Chamber of Commerce. Now, without further ado, we're going to get straight into the questions. So Tessie, the first question goes to you. And now Tessie, we know that, <laughs> now we know that you're a mother of two kids, both in their 20s, and we know that you, um, your work is based around young people, empowering young people within the UK. So the first question is, as digitization increases, how can young girls remain authentic to themselves when others around them seem to be doing the same thing? And do you think parents have a role to play in how young girls are influenced by the media? <coughs> Well, wow, that's a huge question. How long have I got? <laughs> Do you know, I I always say this. I always use this African proverb that says it takes an entire village to raise a child. So I do not believe it's one. It's down to one person, you know. But I think that one of the things that I suppose I have seen across society is that sadly the role of values in our lives has been hugely underplayed so much where we barely talk about values and how to live our lives based on our values. Now, let me, let me explain what I mean. You know, naturally, we are intrinsically governed by something. You know, in the country, you might be governed by rules. In the household, you might be governed by rules as well. Um, but what about individuals? Like, what governs you? What what standards do you create for yourself? And I think that values for you for us as humans are so important. If we we have nothing, then that space is occupied by everything else. And what I see increasingly, sadly, for many young people across society, is we are governed by 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 the masses. We because we have almost minimized the role of values, anything goes and everything goes, and we're constantly in the pursuit of something that's nothing. And I think we just need to rein it all back in and begin to ask ourselves, really, what am I? What are the values that are really important to me? And some people might call it rules, some people might call it standards, whatever you, I call it values because I I truly believe that we need to have a set of values. Look, I'll give an example. I was about 13 years old when I first encountered 
what is called sickle cell anemia because I found that uh, my my friend's brother had sickle cell anemia. And I was incredibly frustrated with the thought that it was uncurable and there was nothing anyone was doing. I remember as a 13 year old, I, I thought, no way, this is this should not happen. I am going to do something. That was, I, I think, my first holy anger at the thought that how do we allow people to suffer? And in some way, if I if I look at the entire map of my my journey, there was always some form of injustice that offended me, that annoyed me, that that kind of created my pathway. And that was because to me, I suppose as a 13 year old then, there was something, I, st I wanted to stand for something. There was some degree of right or wrong that I truly believed in. And I think that the shifts or the minimization of the role that standards or values have in our life means that anything and everything goes. Whereas mm -hmm. if you actually pull yourself back and think, who am I? What do I stand for? What is truly, really, really important to me? When you identify your own personal set of values, in some way they become your navigation in life. And you know, so when I, when you, I, I suppose if I come back to the question that says the role that parents play, of course parents have an incredible role to play, but also uh, so when I come back to that, it takes an entire village to raise a child. Even if you can have set of values that are completely different from your own household, and then begin to look at who are the people that would help shape me? Who are those people that I admire that kind of have the same value sets that I have? And sometimes it can be your peers. They can be people within your own network, family, outside of that. When we come back to the issue of this digitalization, thankfully we have a whole global world where you can begin to look at actually who do I want to be like? Who are those people that have those same values as, as I do? And how have they navigated their life? Um, I think that I, my huge, I'm always um, saddened when I see people, when I, how I know that actually if you create a void, then in nothingness, everything else becomes takes over and I think it's really wanting to encourage young girls to you're more than that you're worth so much more you are enough there's so much in you that you can be anything you want to be just identify who you are who are you you know and like you rightly said I'm, I'm incredibly blessed to have to young adults, I can't call them kids. Every time I'm sure my daughter, has been, <laughs> and every time I say the word kids, I see three-year-old roll her eyes and go, Talk more. Um, and I see them. You know, I remember when they were much younger. They, you know, they they used to say things like, "Yeah, we want to help people," and I used to wonder, "Please don't be like me. Just find your own person." And now mm -hmm. I look at them, and sometimes I say to them, "I'm so envious of you too." that at your age, you're creating your own path and you found your own path and you are pushing against the odds. And sometimes I say to them, I wish I was as good as you when you when I was your age. Yeah. But that's because young people can. They have the ability. And we just need to roll back on those things that people think it's uncool, like kindness <laughs> being a virtue or a value that actually I want kindness. I love yeah. being Kind, and I want to be with kind people. Something as simple as that would almost begin to separate out the when you when you are in the presence of an unkind person, you immediately know by process of elimination. I don't want mm -hmm. to be like this. Do you yeah. See what yeah. Okay. Now, following on um, from what you've just said, we know that you had a national mentoring day um, around four to five months ago. Um, mm -hmm. And we know it's, it's a huge part of the Diana Award. Now, we just wanted to know how young girls can find a mentor um, or a role model, um, but when their surroundings are toxic, how can that impact, I guess, their environment and 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it comes back to what I said, some of what I was saying earlier. Like firstly it's about finding yourself. One of the one of the activities that we encourage young people to do, you know how in our world we're so great with selfies and selfies all about positioning yourself with the right and the right, you know. One of the activities I always encourage young people to do is like your own, your inner selfie. Like do who are you finding yourself? What are your likes? What are your passion? What are your peeves? Because when you identify your, your peeves are, immediately you know that, okay, I'm not going to go there. And yeah. when you find your true selfie, not the external, your, your internal, your real selfie, you begin to kind of navigate who I want to be around. You know, we all know that, you know, you can grow up in a household. You can have two people grow up in a household where there's um, alcohol abuse in that household. doesn't mean that every child in that household is going to grow up abusing alcohol. You can absolutely have someone in that household who, yes, might come out in that way, but also another who would absolutely say, no, I'm never going to touch alcohol. Events can happen in your life. You can determine the outcome by how you respond. And what mm -hmm. is important for me is really encouraging people to find help, find people like you. People, again, it has to be you identify yourself first, obviously, well, yeah. find people who will help you, who would help shape you, who would help connect the dots for you, who have things in common with you. I remember when I first became a chief executive and I wanted to, I found myself obviously in a completely, on, um, in a territory that not a lot of females were in the first place, mm -hmm. uh, but also not a lot of people that look like me. And I began to think, who do I want to who's going to help me navigate this because and i remember fine looking at this person who i completely adored from far um and i approached her and said you know i'm not asking for much i just want to be able to meet you twice a year just someone who is my thought shaper every twice a year let's have coffee i want to download some of my thoughts help me shape those thoughts and she's been an incredible and that's it and you know, she's been an incredible source of um, encouragement to me. Um, I also remember um, when Michelle Obama became first lady. And, you know, many years, firstly, when I became chief exec, we had this um, tradition in my office where every time we received some funding, I introduced this thing called the funding dance. And I made sure everyone in the office did a dance. <laughs> I absolutely love dance and I thought, you know, I'm not going to hide that aspect of me. This is my whole self. You know, it's so important. again, it's about knowing who you are and bringing your whole self. And I know that sometimes people were like, oh, this, this is a bit awkward. I'm like, I don't care, guys. <laughs> we got money. We got money. And I remember when Michelle Obama became first lady and, um, and I could see her as a woman in a high position like going on national telly, doing dance, and some somewhere along, I thought, oh my goodness, there's another black lady who likes to dance and brings her whole stuff to work. And you know, and there's just something about aligning yourself with people that validate you, people that will help you grow. That's also not to say that you 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 block out the naysayers. The naysayers are so important for your journey because they help you grow. They help you check, sense check yourself, but also they help your funding dance even louder. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay. Thank you very much, Tessie, for showing up with us. Yeah, that was really good. I'm, audience, I'm really hoping you're all taking notes. Yeah. I wish I was taking notes right now, but I'll definitely watch back because, you know, Tessie shared so many valuable points and I think you know, from the things that Tessie has shared, it just shows how important um, it is for young women to have rep um, representation around them, you know, and again, having that conviction of steel, because essentially that conviction is what's going to help young women make decisions um, and actually stay true to who they are. Like you said, bring their whole, bring their whole self wherever they are, yeah. right? Um, and 
yeah, it was just it was just great. So thank you so much for sharing. And it's always so important to specify these things to you know this generation. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Tessie, for for sharing that. My question or our next question is going to be to um, Ininye. Now, Ininye is young and powerful and not afraid of using her voice for impact and positive change. Um, my first question to you, Ininye, is um, on the topic of neurodiversity. I know this is a topic that you're very passionate about and you know, you're know you free to share your own story as well um, in your answer if you'd like. But I know, hint, hint, I think you might be writing a book um, this year. I saw on your LinkedIn, I'm not sure if, if that's actually gonna happen, but if it does, then I would love to read it on neuro neurodiversity and your experience with um, dyslexia as well. So the question here is, how can we as a community or with yourself with Enriched Learning help to educate households to foster the skills of neurodiverse young girls? Thank you so much for that question. So yes, I am dyslexic. And I found out that I was, or I, I am dyslexic when I was 11 years old. My parents, God bless them, identified the issue from when I was about five. So it was very obvious that reading out loud was a problem. Spelling was definitely a problem. My mum used to do 60 spelling words every morning before school, just because of the embarrassment, I know. <laughs> very Nigerian mother, it wasn't, in, it, it wasn't in a way, it wasn't in a way, it wasn't a punishment. She was doing it because she was trying to save me from the embarrassment. I, I went to her and yeah. said, I'm embarrassed, you know, I'm the eldest of four children, the rest of them are boys, so I am the matriarch in the house, and I can't spell, that doesn't make sense. Um, and so that was something that my, my family were always very open about speaking to all of us about. And then I won a scholarship and I went to a private school and that's where the issue was properly identified and then I was diagnosed. So that's my story with dyslexia. Where am I now? I'm 22, I have two degrees. I was the first ever student of the year at King's College London. Um, wow. I was listed as one of the top 10 black students in the UK and at the same time as writing my postgraduate dissertation, I was indeed writing a book proposal and I did sign a book deal with Jessica Kingsley Publishing House. So you will have a book about my yeah, journey <laughs> this time next year. And I'll promise to send you a copy. Thank you, everyone. So that's, oh, that's my <laughs> yes. Yes. So that's that's my dyslexia story in a nutshell. How how can we talk about neurodiversity? in our households or how can we bring awareness of it we need to speak on it you know i think especially in black and asian and minority ethnic communities neurodiversity simply isn't spoken about and it's seen as taboo um mm -hmm. my first degree is in religion politics and society so what i found is that religion does come a lot into play within rich learning and working with parents I've seen parents come and say to me, oh, well, I'm gonna take my child to the pastor or the Iman and we're gonna, we're gonna shake this spelling problem out of them. You can't do that, right? Or um, not being able to recognize that, you know, my child fidgeting all the time may be a sign of ADHD or mm. dyspraxia, you know, not having the right coordination. When I say these words to parents, they don't even know what I'm talking about. And I don't blame them because there is no conversation. And when there is conversation, the honest truth is that it doesn't come from somebody that looks a bit like them, which is why they revert back to things that they know really well about, like religion or, or just saying that it's some curse or, or sometimes not accepting it because there's a great shame. Like I personally felt a great shame in not being able to 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 see anyone like me or to understand the problem you know when i was 11 i was shown three pictures jamie oliver albert einstein richard branson and my teachers were like you can be like these people yeah i want to be like richard branson right but there is no other relatability there in the sense that those were all three white men and so how can we kind of raise awareness and, and raise a level of comfortability because right now the discussion around neurodiversity is very uncomfortable. We have to have different faces and different voices talking about mm -hmm. it and we have to do what we're doing now. I'm sitting on a panel 
amongst some of the greatest women in their respective industries and I'm giving neurodiversity a voice that's so important and I'm making it look cool actually like Tessie says these things are not seen as cool by my generation and by many older generations it's cool it's okay and yeah it is cool to have this have dyslexia I just think in a different way you know that's how I was able to start a business at 12 years old I see the world in a different way to other people I I I see my approach to solutions might not be the way you Daniela or you Hannah or you Tessie or you um Dr May might approach it and that's completely fine so it's it's celebrating it and I think the very last thing we need to do in terms of making it comfortable is make employers stand up and say, if you have this problem, nothing is going to happen to you. Because I used to think, oh, right, so I'm dyslexic and I wouldn't want to disclose it. I wouldn't want my teachers to know. I wouldn't want, when I was applying for graduate jobs, I wouldn't want anyone to know that that was something that I was dealing with because I thought I wouldn't get the job. Well, first of all, that's illegal in the UK. There's, there, you cannot not be employed because you have a neurodiverse condition and people need to be aware of that and they need to know their rights. So there needs to be an education surrounding that. And employers need to stand up and say, actually, I like you, I want you, regardless of what you've got going on in your brain. Your brain is a great brain. Let's have you in the office. I think that's what we can do. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, I definitely agree that this is definitely a topic that needs a little bit more spotlight, um, which is, like I said, Inyenye is not afraid of using her voice for positive change. Um, so you've heard it directly from her. And thank you so much for sharing your own personal story as well. Um, I truly believe in the power of storytelling and that every single person has an individual story. And I definitely agree um, that, you know, every single individual has something special about them. And, you know, as a society, we're doing them a grave injustice by not fostering their individual skills regardless of you know what they may have um i know even in cases with autism for example um you may have some children that are autistic in many cases they they are incredibly intelligent mm -hmm. in specific subjects whether it be maths mm -hmm. or science whereas like if we're not having these conversations in the household it can very easily be missed you know mm -hmm. so um thank you so much for that i have another question for you and my question for you is, do you think that the lack of female role models in UK education, especially in the area of STEM, influences young girls' career decisions? Um, and if so, how can um, institutions help to minimize this divide? Okay, so those are two questions in one, so I'll separate yeah. them. I'll start <laughs> with the first part. With Do I think that, you know, the lack of girls and women in the education sector? Is it affecting how education is perceived? Yes. The, I mean, that that's the short answer to the question. The long answer to it is, I think, being honest, it starts from the classroom. Ask mm. yourself how many female teachers you have. Many people, okay, it's predominantly a, a, a female-led profession because of the comfortability that, it, that comes with motherhood and other life pressures but then ask yourself how many black female teachers you've had the first time i had a black female teacher since primary school was when i was doing my postgraduate degree that was 10 years wow. later wow. right okay so that's that that had an impression well it didn't have an impression on me i just said you know what i'm gonna break into that industry anyway and and like you said i've always been that way that's my personality but how yeah. many Inigne's are there? I, I would love for there to be more, a world full of me, fantastic. We all understand how I think, so let's keep it moving. But aside from that, there are some characters who are who are more reserved, who are quieter, who need to be given the hand up so that they can climb up the ladder too. That is, imp that is implicating the, the results we're seeing now. I think women are not shown that the education sector have so many different sides. So. I never told my teachers when I was at school, running my tutoring business, they had no idea I was doing it because oh, wow. I, it was it was this big secret that no one knew apart from my family and she maybe some of my way. friends. Um, I, I was 12 years <laughs> yeah. But um, the reason why is because I had never been told, I didn't even know I was running a business that 
I was in the education sector, we've not been shown yeah. different sides to it. You know, it's not been explained that we have ed tech, we have education as a business, we obviously have education in school, um, education is provided in so many different ways. There's education for children and there's education for adults. It's not just go to school and then that's that's it. So I think there are, it's so multifaceted, there are so many different reasons. The first one being that we're not seeing enough of ourselves in there this in, in in that space the second reason being that we don't have enough female leaders in there and you know I, I was 12 but i decided that i was going to be a female leader in there and and leave the ladder down for anybody else who wants to climb up and that's really important and then with the issue regarding stem um the thing is with the stem sector is that it's still very hostile and i think mm. we're seeing even in the press you know, there are efforts being made. I'm not going to say that we were where we are five years ago or even two years ago. And women have so much courage. But when we step forward and we say, this is a problem, we mm. want to be in this sector too. And things like hashtag not all men start trending. Can you see the resistance? And I think for us, what we have to appreciate and accept is that the problem isn't with us sometimes. Sometimes the, the problem is with men or a different sector and we have to keep on going we have to keep on pushing i think there are some phenomenal women in the stem space that are creating space for women so dr Anne marie in Mathedon, i think she's done a fantastic um job with what she's doing and i think what we have to do is showcase and amplify these women so that young girls are able to see that like tessie said i think there is nothing wrong with wanting to go into beauty or fashion or hair right or wellness or fitness but we need to have more of these conversations and we need to have more of these faces being amplified too so that girls see that they have choice i didn't know that at 12 years old i didn't have to go and do those things because no one showed me right and i think it's so important that we start moving in a world where as well as having supermodels on the cover of magazines we have women like us on the cover of magazines talking about what we're doing alongside those things that are seen as cool so that we can all see that they're of equal importance and they play valid roles in our society does that make sense yeah definitely. yeah definitely yeah. i think this is a good good segue into the next our next speaker isn't it it is yeah <laughs> okay so yasmin you're up next <laughs> okay so your first question is how is Mandala Theatre helping to raise the next female leaders? Leaders, like Aninia mentioned. Yes. So yeah, this is a great it. question and it's so important because mm -hmm. the Plan International UK's report for 2019-20 was that the UK is 17th for gender equality amongst Europe and North America. So there's so much for us to do. So Mandala Theatre Company is all about empowering young people. And a lot of what Essie and um, Tessie and Anine have been saying is so pertinent to what we do. We want young people, young women, to feel like they have their own self-confidence, that they have self-belief, that they are capable of anything and that they can have a voice. And that is about them, yeah, as you were saying, absolutely seeing other people out there, other women out there that are not afraid to be who they are, being your authentic self, that you don't have to pretend to be somebody else you are enough you are everything that is needed to succeed in what you want to do so in terms of mandala theater company we're especially focused on working with young people from black asian and ethnically diverse and white working class backgrounds because we believe that those young people those young women those girls don't get the same opportunities don't have the networks don't get the help the support the hand leg up to to be become part of theater or having their stories told so we enable them to be able to tell their own stories to learn about stories of women that are not afraid to speak out um, and that's so important it's it's crucial we have training courses um, in youth leadership where yeah they're going to get practice in what do they feel passionate about as tessie was saying what is it that you have a passion for because 
that's the biggest thing I think is if young people can identify what am I passionate about, then you know where you're going and you know yeah. where you want to go. So if you then can speak on a panel like this because you are passionate about what you think and believe, that's so important. Another thing that Tessie, you mentioned was, I think we are at a time and it's so important that our values are need to change. We need to value unity, connection, kindness, compassion. Mm -hmm. And we've been brought up in a world where individualism and competition and that masculine patriarchal space is all that we've known. And the feminine space, which is equally powerful, equally strong, but it's about coming up together. That yeah. is the time where we change and we we value those things and we enable young women to say this is we can still be a powerful leader we can still be strong but we don't need to step on other people we don't need to put them down or feel like there's not space for us so yeah, yeah for us that's crucial and um, I'm just going to end on a quote because I think um, Bell Hooks, who's a cultural critic and feminist theorist and writer, says the okay. one person who will never leave us, whom we'll never lose, is ourself. So learning wow. to love our female selves is where our search for love must begin. Definitely. You know what? I think that ties in so well with what Tessie was saying as well about knowing yourselves and knowing your convictions so you can bring your whole self to the table. And I think this ties into our next general question for all our ladies on the panel. So if you have anything to share, then feel free to jump in. And the question is, what is one thing that keeps you grounded? What keeps you grounded, Vicilia? What keeps you grounded, Elozi? Tell us. I think that for me, what keeps me grounded is understand where I'm coming from, to go back to my roots, to know where I'm, I mean, who is my family, where I'm coming from and where I'm going. Because no matter where is your start point, what really matters is where you're going. So sometimes mm -hmm. the beginnings maybe are very humble and very difficult. And I think that when you go back and you see, okay, this is, I make progress. So for me, really what gave me always grounded is that I always remember where I'm coming from and when I'm very frustrated because maybe I'm thinking that I'm not making progress I just look back and I see okay my grandmothers my great-grandmothers where, where, where they were at that point so that is the thing that really keep me grounded that's brilliant and it ties into one of our questions one of our questions to you later on as well so thank you for mentioning that um, Irene um, what keeps you grounded if, if you'd like to share um, thank you. What interesting discussions, lady. As, um, so what keeps me grounded is actually what Tessie mentioned before, values. And I truly resonate um, to what she said, you know, because it has to start with like internal conversations and understanding who you are. You know, but Basila is talking about um, where she's coming from. You know, so when you know your values, um, it, it, that's what grounds me. Just knowing that these are the things that, you know, I identify with. These are the things that defines me or these are the things that I align with. And, you know, also just having a vision, you know, some sort of clarity in, in where it is I want to go. You know, that way I know what I need, who I need, you know, when to do what and just being prepared. Uh, and to also um, have humility, you know, and compassion in yeah. everything um, that we do in, in our interactions, in our entrepreneurship journeys or career journeys and, and, and thinking beyond myself, you know, wanting to create an impact um, in other people in everything that I do. Yeah, beautiful. Um, who, sh who should we pick next? Uh, yeah, jump in. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so this is a I, this is a really interesting question, and it's one that I share with my, kind of my close friends. So, you know, I always think about what keeps me grounded is I call I refer to as the dash, and you know, you have a date of birth, and you always have a date of death, and in between yeah. is the dash, right? The dash. No one knows how long the dash is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You are, we are all on such, a, we're all on a journey. You're on such short time. We have no idea what, how long we're here for. 
and it's like every day that you're here, you cannot afford to waste it because mm. you're a dash. It's a dash. It's you're being given this time. And when you remember that actually you're only here for a dash, only a time, yeah. you will do all you can yeah. and see yourself. You would not waste time. You would not also, this comes back to do not hang around time wasters because you don't, they might have more time than you. So why are you wasting your time with them? Yeah. You know, it's just that keeps me grounded. That reminds me every day that, come on, you might yeah. stumble, you might fail today, but get up because you. the fact that you wake up today means that today is a gift. It's a dash. Mm -hmm. You just keep yeah. going until that dash is over. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, we're going to go straight into, um, actually, Dr. May, if you could just quickly share as well what keeps you grounded, and then we're going to go into our next question for um, Elozi. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I think um, uh, Irene actually mentioned some of the things that were one of the things that keeps me grounded, and that's really my core value and really understanding that I, in my own journey, I tend not to really look left or right when I'm on my journey and not look backwards or look at who's running behind me or running by my side and understanding that this is my journey. And, and also, yeah. I think the thing mentioned something that was really crucial for me is always understanding where I'm coming from and mm. not basically judging myself with other people's goals but actually just understanding that it is this is me I came to this world on my own and I don't have to be who my family is or who my uh, who my friends are or who my colleagues are it's just me and because once sometimes when you forget and you just forget those values and you begin to think about, about other people and what they're doing, it just kind of makes you lose focus. So mm -hmm. I tend to just stay on my lane. And it's so unconscious for me these days that even as a businesswoman, people say, check out your competition. But sometimes I just go, just stay focused. What do I want to achieve? And stay there mm -hmm. and basically understand that I have not changed my core principles principles for anybody yeah i love that stay focused stay in your lane, stay in your lane. <laughs> that's <laughs> that is that is honestly tunnel vision i love that i love that thank you so much daniela Lily. sorry daniela just to mention because obviously i guess i'm the youngest person on this panel and for me what keeps me grounded is the people that i'm working with every single day it's mm. the 12 year olds that i'm teaching actually that keep me grounded it's the mums that I'm working with and I'm talking to every single day. And I think it's so important for us to be rooted in where we're from, but we've got to stay present. Staying in your lane means you're staying present and you're also focusing on the here and now. I could yeah. not be grounded without doing this and then later on this evening going to teach my year 11s. Because yeah. no matter, in, in everything that I do, I've never stopped the teaching side because that's how I connect with those young people. So I think for okay. any, anyone who's struggling to, to keep themselves grounded just look at those who are directly around you and the impact you're making even if it's small because that impact can honestly change someone's life yeah Perfect. yeah definitely again i hope everyone's making notes because <laughs> this is some great stuff we've got here <laughs> right okay we're gonna go straight into our next question this is for you loz um now we know that you have a charity and you uh, work with in work um your work is based in congo so this is just um, a question to ask. In which ways are you helping young girls in Africa, or you can mention um, in the Congo in particular, how are you helping them to reach their full potential and what does their full potential look like to you? Or what does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. yep. That's a great question. Thank you. First, be before answering your question, maybe I think I should put things in context and also okay. explain a little bit the work that were um, that were charity or non-profit is doing in the Congo. Basically, we have realized that in areas located near the Congo River, uh, okay. there were a lot of um, territories where it was difficult to access education. And mm. because of that, maybe children, maybe parents were taking their children out of school or they were sending their children to um, urban centers like the capital or other great cities 
where according to the parents, the children will have better chance to have a better life. So when I, um, I learned that in a village called Makanza, which is located in a northern Congo, uh, children had died on their way to school because they were going to school by, by little boats that we call pirog or canoes. Yes. And so their canoes had overturned. And so the children drowned in the river on their way to school. So this news was a real shock to me. Uh, back in the days, it was 2015, and I could not understand how, at that time, children were still dying on their way to school. So, um, you know, I live in Belgium, so I asked to my minister to let me have a leave so I could go there and see by myself and try to... Mm. Um, to, to try to, to, to find solutions, but not by myself, but with yeah. the entire village, etc. So that's mm -hmm. what we did. I asked my friends to come with me, and there we started to, um, to speak with the parents, to speak with the children, to speak with the teachers. And we understood that um, the parents wanted the children to attend school and to receive an education, which was really important because in some of the areas you have to to um, make sure to advocate to the parents so that they understand the necessity to uh, access education but in the village of Makanza that was not the case but uh, 15,000 children were risking their lives to go to school every day so uh, that's how we started um, our project and that's how our charity started and we are currently um, having a partnership with a local school. This is a Amazing. school that has 200 children. And to us, it was very important that the little girls were given the same chances than the little boys, you know? Yeah. So we wanted um, to have as much as little girls uh, and as much as little boys in the school. And that's what we are doing. And to us, it was very important to start not only conversation, but to start um, giving a special attention to those young uh, children because we wanted them to understand that they were capable as much as a, a boy can be capable to become a leader, which is important to us. We wanted to give the tools, you know, or charity is about giving tools to the youth of uh, the, the Congo, to the youth of Africa, so that they can become the next generation of leader because in our mind we say that everybody should be free like you are in the in the village and you want to live in the city you should be capable to do it but we we are fighting the fact that currently people are ex escaping their village because the city or even sometimes europe is their only way out and to us, if everybody leaves the village, who will stay in the village to, mm -hmm. you know, to keep this tradition to, yes. to and also to to better the village. So that's how, and that's why we are proceeding by the education. So how are we helping the young girls? It's by making sure that they stay in school, so that we are, so we are trying to, um, sometimes to pay the, the school fees. But what okay. we do is to make sure that they receive the proper materials, but most important for us is to um, advocate to the teachers, but also to the parents that it is important for the, the, the child, the, the, the little girl child to stay in school. That's how she will be capable to, to create a better future for her, but also for her family and ultimately for her village. Because in the village that we are helping, we see that like in many parts in the world, women are, are the core, they are the pillars of the society. So that's very important to us. But um, it's, um, our help is also through a lot of conversation. When we are there, we speak with the local authorities, we speak mm -hmm. with the teachers, we speak with the parents, and it is very important. That's how we are doing currently, and we are planning to continue to foster you know, that program of uh, em youth empowerment, really. And to us, the better way to fight um, gender inequality is by investing in school, because in school yeah. for us is the key. Good. Because, in because it is, to me, you can do it, but you will be less successful uh, if you try to change an adult's mentality 
than if you mm-hmm. explain to a child that you know you know uh, that he a little boy is uh, he is equal to his neighbor who is that little girl and mm-hmm. um which during the courses we we want to um, make sure that the children have in front of them the, of them role models that look like them we are in the process of raising funds for our library but in our library there will be a lot of african um you know authors because uh that is very important to us and it is important to us to and to make the the, the children understand that there are people who look like them who accomplish mm-hmm. great things you know mm-hmm. we are ha- we are very happy to see that our children have role models as at school that are women but we want a broader you know broader audience we want to make sure that female ceos go there and explain to the children what they do because if i speak about my proper experience i think that uh, in my path uh, i've had a lot of female and very ambitious and um, generous uh, role models starting by my my own mother but also i had mentors at work and during my university uh, that's why um, i really recognize myself in what uh, mrs tacy was saying because it is important to have that person you can go to and that has more experience than you and also that maybe sees the bigger picture because sometimes we are not really aware of what or qualities are or maybe what what things we could improve in ourselves or and so i always till uh, still today i go to my mentors and i ask okay do you have a little bit of time can we speak about my career a little bit what do you think what do you think i should do and it's not that uh, somebody else will dictate your your life but it it's an advice that can mm-hmm. uh, help you take a decision uh, in in a more in a in a better way so that's why to me it is very important that in our school you know female um, role models have the opportunity to come and to interact with our children and just by just telling their story you know just telling yeah. their story sometimes it can be someone who managed to break the cycle of poverty and that can come and explain and inspire the youth not only the little girls but also the little boys so that they can see how oh, you know it is normal a female executive that's normal you know a female minister that's normal so everybody can can understand it so that's yeah. a little bit what we are doing yeah that's amazing um mm-hmm. it's it's amazing to see the work that you're doing and i think when it comes to work such as this um i love the fact that you mentioned involving locals you know because mm-hmm. i feel like when people are setting up charities ngos whatever it may be internationally they don't involve mm-hmm. the locals but you know mm-hmm. they miss out on a plethora of knowledge and experience that these locals can give them and mm-hmm. um you know they have experience on ground so thank you for sharing that and the importance of that as well and i think this is a a great message to anyone wanting to do work internationally or wherever it may be yeah. to involve the people that they're trying to impact isn't it so it's it's absolutely amazing and you mentioned libraries bcla i believe you had some work setting up libraries so we're going to get into that in a second um but we're going to go into um we're going to go to irene next actually um we've got so many questions for all of you but we're so conscious of time um so bear with us irene so Um Ecopa which is a platform that you founded I believe was created to empower um the unbanked and um you are working to provide financial inclusion within focusing specifically in East Africa. Um so my question to you is what approach do you think needs to be taken to tackle the belief that females are less than um and how are you working with communities in East Africa to debunk taboos because um obviously I, i believe you know more on this area than i do but from from what i know um you know a lot of women um they're seen as less than in a lot of communities so how are you how are you working with ecoba to kind of you know debunk those taboos and making sure that financial inclusion is for women as well in these communities in east africa um Thank you so much Daniela. Um this is a very interesting question and I would like um to share a small story, you know, that gave the foundation to the work that I'm doing um with women in East Africa and beyond. So um I when I graduated from university 16 years ago, 
gosh, it's 17 years ago now, I think, um, I started my company and um, I was fortunate enough, you know, as a young African out of Tanzania, university graduate, and I, I had a passion, you know, I was driven. So, you know, when everybody went to get employed, I started my PR and communication company, which is still around. We're now in Tanzania, Kenya, and looking to go across Africa. So um, a year later, I had an, an, a chance to visit um, rural Tanzania. I had a project that took me to 12 regions in rural Tanzania and in the evenings I would spend time with girls who were my age, some were a little bit younger, some older, just to find out what it is that you know motivated them, who they wanted to be, you know, uh, what was the vision for themselves, all those big questions that um, I thought were important. And uh, by the end of that trip, I realized very quickly that you know I was very fortunate and I probably belonged to an um, a five percent, if not less, of African um, girls at that time, I'm a full grown <laughs> woman now, um, at that time, uh, young women who not only have access to education all the way to university, but also who can create wealth for themselves at a young age and employ other people. What I saw in rural Tanzania were young girls who dropped out of school at very early ages, you know, young mothers, two, three kids, you know, taking care of their families and living what I've come to term as a per day lifestyle, you know, where the focus is in the next 24 hours, how do I survive? How do I put food on the table? How do I solve this issue where two of my kids are not well or my mom is unwell? So it is a very challenging lifestyle and it comes with so many things. I mean, from poverty to some of the things that Elozi um, has talked about to a lot of our cultures, you know, in, in, in how girl children are married at early ages. There are so many things around it. And it's things that we cannot change in one day. But um, I saw an opportunity, you know, to look at a prob problem from where it stems from. And for me, it's access, you know, wealth creation. If Africans, you know, in rural Africa, in cities, across, you know, wherever we are, we're able to create wealth for, the, for ourselves. We will do what's right. We will take our children to school. We will have great, you know, health care practices and, and we'll have access to better health. So it stems from access to finance. And when we talk about access to finance, it's even a crazier situation because formal financial um, banks and, and, and microcredits and micro lenders and all of that only access 16% of bankable population in sub-Sahara Africa. So there is over 80% of bankable population who don't have access <clears throat> to financing. But we are innovative. We are a very innovative continent. So uh, we cre we've created this model called um, community savings groups, where a group of us meet, we save money, and when we have enough in the port, we lend to each other. And that is why, how a lot of the informal sector communities have sustained themselves for so many years. So um, this, is, this, is, this practice has been there for years. It's sustained communities, but it's not transformed them. So when we talk about you know, how do we support communities you know, to, 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 to change the narrative that women uh, are not less than, we can talk, we can hold meetings, and trust me, I have done that. But unless we go right to the root of the problem, which is, you know, how do we create opportunities so that women in rural Africa, women in informal sectors, women everywhere have access, you know, to financing and can create wealth for themselves, none of these other things, you know, will, you know, will, um, will really come to, to effect. And uh, so we're working, um, we built ECOBA, which is a digital platform to digitize community savings groups. And we're digitizing because, you know, there's a lot of data that is being missed. You know, the informal sector, women in, 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 in rural Africa continue to be unbankable. It's not that they don't have great financing practices. It's just that there are no records, you know. So ECOBA um, keep records of all the community savings uh, activities. And, you know, then we're able to bring in other value additional uh, partners, whether it's formal banks or insurance and the micro insurances. And it also has a marketplace feature because at the end of the day, it's not that women in that level are not producing 
they are producing. But the issue is capacity, producing uh, competitive products and access to market. So we are seeing a, a huge improvement. And uh, some of the women that we have worked with, you know, who um, some of the girls that I met at that time, because I've been doing this for so many years, from 2006 uh, through um, physical platforms, it's only in the last two years that we've digitized some of the, most of the things that we've been um, working on. And we are seeing such a huge, 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 huge um, improvement and um, a, a big shift in how they look at themselves in the decisions that they make for themselves, in, in how they impact their, not just their families, but their immediate communities. And um, I believe, you know, it's about how do we give um, women tools that they need so that they can create wealth for themselves so that they can take, it's not like we don't know, we know and we want it, but you know, how do we get to that point? Okay. okay, thank you so much for that. Um, I love everything that you said, and especially the, the fact that you spoke about opportunities and giving young women the tools that they need and highlighting the fact that they do have those those tools. It's just about, I guess, accessing them and giving them to, to the young girls. Yeah. Um, that leads me on to the next question for you, Dr. May. Um, now, we know that thousands of women go to Europe with a promise of a job, but many of them are forced into prostitution. And the UN, the UN reported that 80% of the 20,000 women that arrive, especially in Italy, are victims of sex trafficking. Now, our question to you is, what work can be done to ensure that young women, young girls, are offered the right opportunities early on to prevent them from seeking, um, I guess, seeking other opportunities elsewhere? Thank you. That's a very powerful question. And uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. And um, yeah. some, some of the previous speakers yeah. have, have mentioned some of, you know, some of the critical tools that uh, young girls, and I'll speak for Africa, you know, um, can access in order to see opportunities where they are. The biggest thing is mentorship. Mentorship, mentorship, mentorship. Because, um, you know, it, it's about seeing what or who um, was where you are and they manage to do things that you know are not just sustainable but are impactful and you can relate to that person so how can we create more role models um, that look sound feel and are from where most of the girls in Africa are from. And uh, I saw this again back to 2006 when I was uh, going through Tanzania talking to young girls. Um, the the, the young, fact that. Yeah, no. mm -hmm. Sorry, can you hear no, me? Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So the, the, fact, the fact that you're in a village somewhere and you, know, you, you, you can only relate and see what is surrounding you, you um, unfortunately, a uh, school dropout. So your vision for your life is centered around that. You know, as long as you, 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 you can't visualize it, it's hard to achieve it. So we need to create more platforms, you know, that will provide girls in Africa and girls everywhere um, access to role models and tell narratives that um, are empowering and showcasing different women doing different things that are not necessarily cool, but important. And uh, when I talk about that are not necessarily cool, with technology, we are seeing a lot of, um, how do I put it, fake lifestyles, you know, on, on social media and, 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 and it looks fabulous. And I'm sitting here in Dar es Salaam and I want to go in Europe and, and, and think that it, when I get there, that is what will become of me. But we need to showcase stories of Ilozi, who is out in the Congo uh, doing some amazing thing. And here she is talking on this great, great, great platform. So uh, to address this, we also built uh, a mentorship platform called TWAA, T-W-A-A. And basically, it's a tool for women across the world to network with each other, to share insights and uh, knowledge. And uh, it has great content creation tools. It's also built to give women, like all of you, um, an opportunity to create communities that are sustainable, where, you know, uh, Bisila is in 
um, all the way in the US, I think, if I'm not mistaken, because I'm, I'm a huge fan of you. So I have been following you up for years. I'm so happy to see you. But you're still <laughs> able to support a community in East Africa and, and, and take them through a mentorship journey. So it's mentorship. <laughs> role modeling is creating content that is empowering and that showcases uh, that the opportunities are available. It's having conversations like this all the way to um, the grassroots, you know. So yeah. uh, okay. I can see that um, there is potential in um, their surroundings. They just yes. need to yeah. have more, yeah, those opportunities. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Okay, Dr. May, we're going to go straight to you now. Um, so the question we have for you is that um, we know that you've written a book and it's called The Bilateral Cooperation and Human Trafficking. And you said that lawmaker you said that lawmakers lack consideration of social cultural factors that influence anti-trafficking outcomes. Mm -hmm. Now our question to you is, can you give an ex can you give examples of work that work you did to tackle factors that serve as barriers to the implementation of anti-trafficking laws? Yeah, so I've been working in the um, area of human trafficking for the past 17 years and it all started yes. in the UK. Um, my specialty is basically on human women's rights and uh, human trafficking. Uh, I started in the UK working with uh, black and Asian minority ethnic groups in the UK, uh, looking into issues of gender-based violence, uh, mm -hmm. where um, you can feel cases of human trafficking, uh, domestic violence, female genital mutilation. And in my work, I came across a lot of uh, young girls who have been trafficked from, especially from Nigeria to the UK. And, you know, we tend to work on their cases with social workers. Um, and we find that, you know, using you know, first of all, you have to, uh, first of all, identify a, a, a victim as, as being trafficked. Uh, the UK came up with what they call the National Referral Mechanism, which is used to identify victims of trafficking. What we found in, in, in the cases that we had to deal with when it comes to trafficking was that um, um, victims from Nigeria or some African countries where human trafficking is quite peculiar, wearing um, Conclusive, conclusive, or what, what would I call it, like concluded as being victims of trafficking, mainly because it didn't fit into the usual narrative, the general narrative that you would find law enforcement officers understand or understood about human trafficking. And that really worries mm -hmm. because, especially because of their immigration status, it was often difficult to see them first, 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 uh, first of all, as a victim, but mostly they see them first as. Uh, immigrants who are illegal mm -hmm. and that's quite wrong because on one hand a, a, a woman is undergoing the trauma the physical psychological trauma of being trafficked while at the same time being treated as a criminal uh, because of their illegal status as migrants in the UK and yeah. we felt that the laws weren't really looking at them for what they really were and for that reason they wouldn't get the right support that they needed you know that was actually one of the things that prompted me to um, to apply for a scholarship to study, to um, research a bit more about trafficking because we didn't even have a lot of uh, data or uh, information about these peculiarities in trafficking, especially from Nigeria, where you'd find that um, bondage, keeping victims in bondage, keeping them under tra um, being trafficked or keeping them in slavery was, um, uh, was more social cultural. So you would see victims of trafficking say that they can't really report their trafficker because they've been bounded by oaths through what we call juju here in, in Nigeria or well, using African traditional religion. And how, how what do you expect uh, a metropolitan police officer to do with the knowledge of juju when they've never heard about it before? Yeah. So I, I, I remember being at the conference one time and uh, I think um, it was a, a police officer, a woman actually, she, who said, or who argued that this was brainwashing. And I was like, no, juju is real in Africa. For It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter if it's English or if it's not, it's not European. This is what the victim believes in. And if that keeps that victim in bondage, it stops you from finding that trafficker and prosecuting them and thereby also preventing these girls from being trafficked because without protecting these girls uh, uh, or prosecuting their, their traffickers, then you can't actually really pre prevent them from being trafficked because they are not going to report. And I think that, 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 
that will take you seriously later on. And if you read now in the last five years or six years, when you Google on the internet, you see that a lot of academics and also uh, people, frontline workers, when it comes to human trafficking or anti-human trafficking, are beginning to talk about these peculiarities. And that way, we start to see an increase in identification of women who have been trafficked. For me, in my work uh, in the UK, apart from my book, which I felt contributed to the knowledge or for uh, understanding trafficking between Nigeria and the UK, um, I also... Um, Worked with. When I moved back to Nigeria, I became an anti trafficking advisor for a dual state government, which is really the epicenter of trafficking from Nigeria, even though mm. Nigeria is the first, um, first the, one of the top countries, uh, source countries for trafficking into the UK. So I've been doing that work. I've worked in over 20 countries for, for the UN, uh, for the Kofi Annan mm. uh, uh, Training Center for the World Bank and the different uh, big institutions, both locally, mm -hmm. nationally, and internationally, looking at issues of gender and uh, human trafficking. Uh, I, but one of the things that I felt that was often missing was actually one of the first questions which you asked earlier, which is the role of parents and family in the trafficking of women and girls. And that prompted me to start this organization, which I call uh, Raising Women Initiative. And we had this major project called uh, Raising Girls Project. We, we talk about we talk about girls every day, but we don't talk about how we raise these girls. We talk about mm -hmm. women's rights every day, but we don't talk about how we raise women to be uh, girls to become the women we want them to be yeah. tomorrow. We, I, I found that when I, whilst I was um, younger than this, and I've been on platforms where women uh, talk about the rights of women, I don't see young girls like me. I remember I, I often would raise my hands and stand up and say, I'm the youngest person here. Where are young girls? We are talking about them today, but they're not here. So I thought mm -hmm. I, if I had the opportunity, I would create a platform to help raise the voices of girls to actually be part of the discourse on issues that affect them the most before they become women. And that was why I created the Raising Girls um, project and where there we just get girls really talk about their experiences and especially what one of the things that Tessie mentioned which is quite crucial these girls need to know themselves you can yeah. they need to have confidence they need to see yeah. themselves as capable uh, and if you want to prevent them for from being trafficked you need to actually start to build that confidence and parents mm -hmm. have a role to play where you tell where you decide for a girl that she's a woman. And I remember as a kid, they would tell me, oh, you're a woman, you shouldn't do this. What does that mean, really? Uh, this is the rule for, because that's where the gender roles are really created from when you were a kid. When you were little, you don't know the difference between yourself and your brothers, but then your parents start to make that demarcation and it, it, it gets validated even when you go into the society and people start to tell you, remind you that you're a girl. Also, the pressures that comes from parents themselves, especially, I would say, since I moved back to Nigeria, what I see, girls have a lot on their shoulders. They carry quite a lot. People expect so much from them. If you go to a place like Edosti, for instance, you find that these girls who you see that embark on who are traffic for prostitution, you would find that they come back and become the madams and start to recruit other girls to become mm. prostitutes. And they show them, look at what I've done in my father's house. I've built a home. I have bought, bought cars. And then you see parents telling their young kids, oh, look at um, uh, Anita just bought a car. She just did this. Mm. What are you doing for your family? And so you see that pressure comes there, um, you know, really gets to them. We, uh, I think in 2000, from 2017, mm -hmm. uh, at those states uh, enacted a law against human trafficking. And we started what we call the uh, Managing Migration to uh, Develop Development Program, which the EU and the World Bank sponsored. I was a coordinator for that uh, project. And we started to keep data of all the uh, women and girls and men who were returned by the IOM who have been either trafficked or mm -hmm. somehow got stuck trying to get, get to Europe and they've been abused in, on, on transit. We, we were able to, um, we came across 50 something thousand um, uh, people and no, uh, yeah, I think, uh, is it 5,000? Yeah, 5,000 people, over mm -hmm. 5,000 people. And you would find that most of the women that were, 
were interviewed said that they left because of pressures from pressure from their families. So you see that families do have a role, how they raise their girls, the opportunities they give their girls, the kind of confidence they build in their girls. And when we talk about addressing trafficking, we don't talk about the role of the role of parents enough because I feel that families are one of the biggest culprits of human trafficking. And mm -hmm. we just focus on the traffickers and we don't think yeah. about them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to me for sharing that with us. Just because of time, we're going to have to move on quickly. So, Isia, this question is for you. Now, we have to admit, um, before we ask you the question, is that we did have a look at one of your recent blogs. We did. <laughs> and we loved reading it. So, this is kind of centered around your blog. Um, you mentioned that um, you spoke about your restlessness and your anxiety um, that you felt for years because you didn't really know what you were meant to do. Um, so we just wanted to ask you, how would you advise young girls who, young girls in this micro generation um, that expect to have everything figured out right now, um, how would you advise them and how would you kind of explain to them that there is a process and that they do have to understand timing as well? Well, thank you so much for the question. But before that, I just wanted to congratulate all the ladies in the panel because really this blew up my mind. It's very early in the morning here in New York. I got up <laughs> with you guys and I'm really so inspired that I'm thinking, wow, how much amazing thing that to start my Friday this way. So thank you so much for having me. I'm extremely honored to be here. And it's a, I mean, it's a great question um, what you mentioned because I mean, I could relate with everything that you all say, and that's what I think that I would not be repetitive, but I think that the first limit that I encounter in my own journey, it was my own limits of the mind. Okay. Some of them, they were installed maybe by my family belief system, other than it's because of my own insecurities when I was growing up, or okay. the expectations that people have from me. One of the things, uh, I grew up in Spain, being the first generation of African immigrants in Spain when it was not black people. So I didn't have really anyone to look up to. Uh -huh. And I remember I came from a school one day crying and I said that they called me black because one of the kids thought that if I sit next to him, it will be contagious to become black. And he started crying yeah. in middle of class and say, to the teacher, please change me places because I don't want to be black like her. So I explained this to my family and my father told me, look in the mirror, what color are you? <laughs> and for me, when you are seven, eight years old, it's like shocking because you don't know really what color are you. You want to be like other kids. Yeah. And he told me, you have two problems. You are black and you're a woman and you live in this country. So that for me was a sentence to define who I'm going to be. And also they put the weight of a whole continent on my shoulders because wow. they said to me, you are the first generation. So if you messed up, the people behind you, they will have to pay for your mistakes. Wow. So I always have this responsibility to, to be the good girl, to don't do like other people are doing and everything. <laughs> and of course, I didn't know what I was born for or what is my mission. All of this weight of mission, uh, I do believe that we could not tell the kids that the mission change shifts and different interest comes. And I think that we have to be really more people from the Renaissance because you, I mean, they told me when I was a little kid, you're not good for math. In this family, nobody's good for math. So obviously I dislike everything that has to do with math. And this lead me to the next point like Irene said before, how we access capital when you don't like math, when you women are so afraid of numbers. So when you grow up like this, you really develop something that you, it's very difficult to bring wealth in yourself when you don't really know math or you scared of finances. So all yeah. of this really helped me to shape up my journey because I realized that sometimes you don't have a mission, the mission finds you. And mm -hmm. I, always tell the, I always tell the little girls, don't have that pressure to know what you want to be. And it's a great place to be when you don't know what to be because you might like many things. And I like many things. So I make a cocktail with my career. I study law and economics, but I also love communication. I love fashion. So I do everything. So I play with it. And this is what really makes me happy because I'm only being honest to myself, which Stacey said, just get to know yourself. So that's where your mission relies on. 
It's to know who you really are. And that from there, you build your mission in life. And that helped me to really build bridges because this is who really I am. I realized mm -hmm. that I was born in Europe. Then I live in America for 21 years and I'm from the continent. I have to build that bridges. So mm -hmm. all of my network, I put it on service of these little girls that are in Africa. So I do STEM programs in Africa. We have an organization called Inspiring Girls to really have women to look into. So why you don't, you want to be an astronaut? It will be great that you're an astronaut. So mm -hmm. I'm going to bring you an astronaut. So you're going to talk to her from oh, Africa. If you want to be a police or just be a pilot, you're going to have somebody who's going to speak with you. And guess what? Mm -hmm. You don't have to travel to see her because there is technology. So we mm -hmm. make these women to do little videos and send them to these women in Africa and get to know that, wow, you don't have to be only a doctor or a teacher, or <laughs> you could be a pilot, or you could be an astronaut. I mean, I could go to the moon with you because dreams are unlimited. So this is one thing I did and also, one person I forgot who raised the point about um, the girls don't be in the conversations, but also the mothers sometimes, they don't know what conversations to have. So mm -hmm. I built through entrepreneurship, how these women could be free. You could not teach your daughter how to be financial freedom if you don't know what is financial freedom. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. It's important that first you empower these mothers. Without yeah. these mothers being empowered, impossible to have kids that are empowered. And you have to also yeah. empower the men because a man who is empowered will never use violence against a woman. So from my perspective, it's not only about women conversation, I invite the men also in the conversations. And okay. we do this through Empretech. Empretech is a program that we do that we create opportunities through entrepreneurship in women that they are really in rural areas, very difficult, mm -hmm. and they're able to really build their own business plans, we held them through education. Because if I give you a microcredit, okay, you got 5,000 euros, you're in Burundi, perfect, but you don't have the education. You're not mm -hmm. gonna be able to return that credit and you're gonna lose the money and you're gonna have money the same place that you started. So we make sure that we just monetize the whole process and you get the education that you need to really build the company. So we review all the business plans. They have mentors like me and other people who we take care of them to make sure. And also we give them the most important thing, visibility. We mm. tell the story because when these women have been able to do this project, we give them the spotlight, we create awards for them. They are able to take the story. They go to different countries and they could explain this. And then other women could see that and say, wow, she did that, I could do it too. So this is basically also how the girls know something, how they know their mission is through their mothers too. Yeah. Because yeah. They spend a lot of time with the mother. So when mm -hmm. a mother doesn't know what is her mission, how she going to help her daughter to understand what is her vocation? It's, it's yeah. very difficult. Sorry, that was absolutely astonishing. Um, it was beautiful. I think it really ties into what Dr. May said as well, that education starts from the household, you know, by, by um, parents, mothers being educated on social affairs, international affairs, whatever's happening in the local area, that we can prevent prostitution, we can prevent human trafficking, we can prevent so many things. So I love that you touched on that. And like Hannah said, we both read your blog and we also love that you mentioned, you, you shared a little bit about your mother's yeah. story and how she traveled across borders to pursue her dream as well. So when she was 14. So thank you so much for sharing. Now we are very conscious of time. Um, we have so many more questions for all of you, but. We're gonna just jump um, quickly to um, Yasmin and then we have one final question for Elozi and then we're gonna check if the public, um, the audience has any questions for you ladies. So Yasmin, we just have um, a quick question for you. And the question is, Yasmin, how can the, the creative arts be used as a tool to change the girl child's perspective of social injustice? Yeah, that is a key question because Mandala Theatre Company is all about focusing on social justice. And yes. in order to get social justice, yeah, you've got to look at the world around you. You've got to look at what's happening to young people, to young girls, to young women. And so a lot of what we do, we work in schools. We have a project at the moment on looking at school exclusion because one in two people in prison in the UK were excluded from school as children. And 
we are failing them. We are society is failing those young people. So we mm -hmm. spent time in pupil referral units, working with young women, working with young men as well asking them about what's happened to them in the education system what has yeah. failed them a bit like yeah other people on the panel were saying it you are looked at if you don't follow a formula about yes. academia you can end up you know being seen as a failure and if you're yeah. labeled that at such a young age how are you going to find your way through so the exactly. stories that we where we talk with the young people we do creative workshops with them then we feed all of this work to writers and we bring a production in its very early stages back to the same young people and ask them for their input what would they change what would they want to see more of and then have panel discussions after we've created this piece of theatre. We've done pieces of theatre about unaccompanied asylum seekers, young people seeking asylum, and what happens to them when they're 18, spending months with weekly sessions with young people who have had that experience. With, and, and so the, the work that we do, if you co-create it with young people, they have, they're bringing, not, they don't have to expose themselves by telling their stories, but they can feed into a fictional narrative where they have the chance to express what they're feeling. And with Mandala Young Company, we're currently working on a piece that looks at the aftermath of war on the civilians um, and it's not set in any one place but especially the aftermath on female civilians and also the aftermath of war on the earth on mother Gaia the earth itself and this is created with young people who have come through our training courses they're not professionals the, so the young company are semi-professional and they are working on that and and talking about you know obviously in the UK luckily we haven't experienced war for ourselves here but we've been part of wars in Iraq wars in Afghanistan and a lot of these young people are coming from backgrounds where they know of relatives that have have been the have been there and and experienced war so it's opening eyes opening minds and these stories that are stories that aren't heard that if young people can hear the stories debate the stories see people like them tell the stories tell the stories themselves then you're opening minds to question social injustice that prejudice and discrimination is not a place that you have to accept that it's a place that you can challenge yes. um, you can tell another story and the seven billion people in this world whose stories are being told who is the voices yeah. that are being heard and so for us there are so many ways that the arts bring young people into a place of empathy into a place of standing mm -hmm. in another's shoes into a place of understanding and questioning a world that they can change and they yeah. have the power to change Definitely. So yeah, thank you very much, Yasmina. Thank you. Now, Elizy, we're going to go on to you now. Um, this will be the last question. Um, so, Elizy, briefly tell us your route into becoming the advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defence of the Kingdom of Belgium, and how would you advise young girls to succeed in um, to succeed as a woman in diplomacy? Uh, could you please repeat just the first part of the question? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so, briefly explain to us your route into becoming the, minister, uh, the advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defence in Belgium and what, how would you advise young girls who have an interest in diplomacy to succeed um, in that field? Okay, uh, I'll try to be as short as possible. Uh, first of all, I think I've always had, um, since I was a kid, I, I always knew that it was possible to influence positively the world around us. So once I was uh, you know, at university, I decided to, to study um, political science because I wanted to know more about, you know, Belgium, which is my other country, and her and the, you know, the, the relationship with other states in the, in the world, the relationship with Africa, uh, how what was history of my country of origin, etc. 
And then uh, since I had this interest, once I graduated, I had um, the um, opportunity, you know, to uh, uh, succeed uh, a, a test that you have to pass in order to work for the, um, you know, the Belgian administration. And uh, I, I I passed the test and then I got, you know, hired at the um, Directorate General, which is responsible for European affairs, which was my main uh, focus at the time. And, you know, there was the Minister of Foreign Affairs and um, I, I've seen uh, on TV that he had uh, taken some uh, position in, certain, uh, in a certain uh, subject. And so I started to write, you know, just by myself, just um, recommendation or I thought that his proposition with all due respect was not going further as it could. I thought that it was possible to make a bigger impact. So uh, being the, the person that I, that I am, I don't, I don't fear. So I just wrote a, a letter to the minister, but very politely, right? Uh, it was very polite, but I said, you know, minister, I think you should also consider A or B, or did you know that? What about if, you, what about yeah. if Belgium was maybe taking this stance? And I went to the, to the office of the minister, which was, I think, too, uh, it was in the same building as mine at the time. And I just, uh, you know, gave that to someone of the cabinet. Oh, but to me, I was, <laughs> you know, the, the possibility that this whole letter will arrive to the minister desk was yeah. very very little so I, to me it was like okay girl you will never hear from from anyone again and mm -hmm. one day i think it was two months after that i received a call actually from the mm -hmm. minister office they wanted to see me uh, the chief of staff not the minister but the chief of staff wanted to see me and okay. he told me uh, i've heard that you wrote to the minister and we we saw the letter and the minister saw the letter and he thought that it was you know the the suggestion were interesting so uh could you please uh maybe can would you would you be interested in taking a, a position in the cabinet because there was at the time wow. someone who was leaving and it, it, that was also you know another opportunity someone was leaving and they needed to fill the position as soon as possible and since yeah. i was already working in a ministry and that's how my adventure began and uh, I've been there for eight years, and uh, and now I'm working still for the ministry, but not at, not for the minister because uh, you know at one point you uh, you grow, and I wanted to learn other things. After okay. I I've been blessed and fortunate to start my career at the office of the minister, and I thought I think I've learned so much. So when the minister changed and he went. Uh, to take another position, I said to myself, you know what, you need to forge your own path and not only be in the shadow of someone. And okay. uh, that's the reason why now uh, I have another position still at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I'm very glad because uh, now Belgium has his first uh, women of, of, yes, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs right now is a woman. And that's for the first time ever. And you know, when I was in the cabinet, I used to see this kind of Hall of Fame where you had every single minister of foreign affairs and they were all looking alike men men old men men old men 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 <laughs> and now you see a woman and you know the presentation matters so much, much you know? yeah people yeah, sometimes forget it and it is so important to see someone maybe who looks a little bit like you and now because we have a woman there she is very you know she has all the competence all the skills mm -hmm. she has that but I know she's not there because of of her gender, but it makes such a difference for, for all little for all women who want to become a diplomat. They know that they can be they can become the head of the diplomacy yeah. of the Belgian diplomacy. And so yeah. to young young women, I will, I will stop there. To young women, I would say just keep being informed. Inform yourself as much as, as you can. You know, there right now with. Um, with lockdown there, we discover so many podcasts. Please mm -hmm. don't, I found every day uh, a new one, very interesting. On you can find uh, information in books, but also on YouTube. There are very informative channels that I can recommend. Um, and I, I think, uh, never think, never think that you can, oh. never think that you mm -hmm. don't belong. That's what I wanted to say. That's, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's powerful. Elodie, so sorry to cut you. You've only got a few minutes left. I think you have like maybe two minutes left. Powerful words. Um, you have some amazing recommendations as well. And um, 
if you'd be okay with it, just share it on your platform as well. Um, any book recommendation, podcast as well. And anyone watching that is interested, feel free to, you know, just um, reach out to Loz and she'll be happy to let you guys know. But in just a few words, this is for all the ladies, just, just to round up, we would love to know in two words, what is a now woman to you? Quick fire. He's going to go first. He's going to go first. Let's go with Dr. May first, if you're ready. <laughs> or just anybody that's ready. I would say that a now woman is a woman who is comfortable in her own skin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Comfortable in her own okay. skin. Dr. May, I think you were ready, but I think you were muted. <laughs> Still, yeah, um, I would say, I, I would say, uh, a now woman is a woman that is confident being a woman. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Who's next? Um, I, I would say, now woman is a woman who is open minded to learn new things and um, mm -hmm. present in and aware of what is happening, not just in their lane, but you know in areas that can also support and influence her life. Okay. Beautiful. Yasmin? I'd say a now woman is a woman who is with other women, who helps mm -hmm. other women rise. That's okay. a now woman. Yeah. And then there you had... Mm -hmm. um, a now woman is limitless. There's Ooh, no limit. I love that. Just go for it. Priscilla? <laughs> <laughs> And a woman is a woman who knows that the power lies within and she mm -hmm. uses her feminine energy. And when you really are able to tap into your divine feminine, you could definitely change the world. Wow. Yeah, powerful. Elozi, I think you're last. Yes, I would say a now woman is fearless and she knows her worth. She breaks ceilings and she mm -hmm. always, I think, uplifts other people. Beautiful. Amazing. Oh, this is so great. It's, it's such really a shame that we run out of time. Um, we absolutely love the conversation. Um, any last words from us, Hannah? Um, I just want to say thank you, ladies, for sharing everything that you've um, shared with us today. Um, all of you have shown um, you have shown us that, you know, just be bold, be fearless, mm -hmm. go for it, and just accept who you are, um, love who you are, and just keep going. So I love everything that all of you have shared. Um, yeah, that's all from me today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll have no questions from the audience. I mean, we don't really have much time, but um, <laughs> if anybody does have any questions, then feel free to send an email. You can find the email on the WOTC um, website. Thank you once again, ladies. It was an absolute honor. Um, and we would absolutely love to connect with you, with all of you ladies afterwards as well. And with the audience, um, you know, you can find all of these ladies on Instagram, LinkedIn. If you want to network, LinkedIn is the place to go. If you don't have one, make sure you create one. Um, and yeah, thank you once again, ladies. This was absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. So thank much. you so much. Thank you. No worries.